The Trump team looks to be trying a new defense tactic, with reports now indicating just about every aspect of the president's life, past and present, is under investigation, including the Trump Organization, the Trump Foundation, the Trump Campaign, the Trump Transition, the Trump Inauguration, and the Trump Presidency. Now, if his appearance on weekend talk shows is any indication, Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani is giving up on deny, 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 and apparently going with admit it all, then change the rules of law. It's not a crime, George. Paying, paying uh, $230,000 to Stormy whatever and paying 150000 to the other one is not a crime. If it's not a campaign expense, it can't be a campaign contribution. That was Rudy whatever. Perhaps worse yet, Giuliani also admitted Trump was aware that Michael Cohen was pursuing that Trump Tower project in Moscow through almost the end of the presidential campaign. According to the answer that he gave, it would have covered all the way up to November of, covered all the way up to November of 2016. He said he had conversations with him about it. Well, that's new. But at least the administration is riding the ship in one area, with where Budget Chief Mick Mulvaney will be taking over as acting White House Chief of Staff. But then within hours of that announcement came the discovery of this video from just before the 2016 election. Yes, I'm supporting Donald Trump. I'm doing so as enthusiastically as I can, given the fact that I think he's a terrible human being. I'm sure that's gone over well. Of course, on the other side of the aisle, the Democrats have had a few leadership problems of their own. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi says she has the votes to take back the Speaker of the House spot when Democrats take over the majority in January. But it has been a bumpy road. Last week, she struck a deal with several members of her own party who opposed her speakership, agreeing to limit her term to four years to help make room for a new generation of leaders. Congressman Seth Moulton was among those leading that charge. And although he says he sports Pelosi now, he's been getting a lot of flack back home for his opposition. The majority of Americans want this change. The majority of Democrats want this change. Yes, we do. We want this change. Politico says the deal is unprecedented, a major win. The Washington Post says significant concession to the demand for generational change. Others say it's a misguided, sexist effort, and you eventually caved. Why are the latter wrong and the former right? Because this has never been about one person. This is about generational change for our party. It's about an amazing change election when this incredibly diverse group of lawmakers won uh, the majority back for Democrats. And we want to give this new generation a chance to lead, this new generation a chance uh, to have their ideas heard. And this new uh, agreement uh, that uh, limits the top three positions uh, to term limits, three terms, retroactive, so this is their final term unless they get a two-thirds vote of the caucus to extend one more term, is unprecedented in a wonderful way that's going to be good for the party. Yeah, but while Nancy Pelosi says she'll honor it even if it's not voted in in February in the caucus, the other two guys who are a mere 79 and 78, and I know you don't talk about age, but I do, uh, uh, they are not. They say they're not bound by the deal. Stenny Hoyer at well, 79 they, they will, says he has no desire to go anywhere. Well, they will be bound by the deal when the caucus votes for it. If and the caucus we, votes for right, it. Right. We, we delayed the vote until January so that all these new freshmen can be a part of that, and I'm confident the caucus will, will pass it because this is exactly the kind of reform that we need. And the other lesson of this is that we can be stronger as a party by, by being willing to have these tough debates, by having these, these, these air these issues, and then uniting uh, when it's time to go forward. You, know, seem, you seem pretty enthusiastic about this four-year deal, but you were on Boston Public Radio with me and Marjorie Egan not so long ago. Maybe it was Jared Bowen, I'm not sure, on November 3rd. And here's part of what you said. If she would say, my whole leadership team will step down in a year and we will have across the board new elections for the top three, then yes, I would support her. I think that's exactly the kind of meaningful, reasonable transition plan that will set our party um, on the right path for the future. That was then four years now. Four years gets you through a presidential election into the next cycle. That's a long time. Well, first time. of all, the, the, the term limit is two years, um, unless there's an extension, mm. which requires two-thirds of the vote of the caucus. So actually, that's pretty close to what we laid out. But the nature of a deal is you have to come to a compromise. So uh, her position was no term limits at all. Um, that's the top three position. Our, our, our position was we want to have some sort of term limits. The fact that we got term limits passed for the first time, and, uh, for the first time that's, this, is really, this is really significant. And it shows that we can have this tough debate as a party. We're 
we're strong enough to have this debate uh, and then to move forward and be unified uh, so that we can take on Trump. Were you part of the negotiations or just an inspiration for these final negotiations? So I was, uh, we were all, we, we as a team were part of the negotiations. I was not one of the emissaries. You didn't uh, negotiate with that, her? No, the emissaries uh, were led by uh, Representative uh, Pearl Mutter. From Colorado. Uh, yeah. And then Linda Sanchez and uh, Bill Have you Bill spoken Foster. to uh, speaker to be Pelosi since this deal? We've, we've, you know, we talk all the time. And have you we actually had a really, since this deal? I don't know, I'm trying to think the last time I spoke to her. Uh, I certainly spoke to her over Thanksgiving. We had a long conversation about spending Thanksgiving uh, with my daughter, first ever Thanksgiving for her. Congratulations on that. And, and, and her, Thanksgiving, her Thanksgiving tradition with her granddaughters the, the, and grandsons. The point is that, you know, you got to be able to do this in a civil way. You got to be willing to have this debate, not shy away from it. You know, there are a lot of people who shy away from these uh, debates. I don't know if you want me to be a, a milk toast congressman or something. I don't want Jim, you to be. But, you're not my but, congressman. You can but, be whatever like, that, you I mean, think there are you some should people be. Who should, but but this is the kind of vigorous debate that we need to have in our democracy. Are you worried we need though, to have in our in our party? Are you worried there's a price going to be paid? People say she's a pretty tough person. You're on the she armed services committee. Yeah. You want to be on the transportation committee. Are you going to pay a price for this either? in terms of committee assignments or in terms of money coming back to your district? Well, just look at the, the last two years. Uh, you know, I was calling for change after the last uh, election in yeah. 2016. This isn't a new position for me. I'm just, I'm just someone who stands up for what I believe in. And we had an extraordinarily successful term. We were named the most, uh, I was the most successful, uh, or I guess the most um, productive, uh, most bipartisan in the state, uh, most productive freshman Democrat, and uh, held more town halls than any other district in the country, and won an award for office transparency. So the point is we can get a lot done for the district and for the country and still be willing to, to engage in these important debates. Democrats picked up, I don't know if it's 40 or 41 seats, and I know uh, somebody you worked with and endorsed in North Carolina may be an additional seat, but it's in the range of 40. Uh, the so convention of, of those 40, uh, Twenty-five percent, so ten right now, maybe eleven, uh, were the veterans that uh, that, that I heavily supported with Serve America, and so it's been a huge part of winning the new Democratic majority. The conventional wisdom amongst Pelosi critics—I don't know if you voiced this—was that she was going to hurt the Democrats in the midterms. In light of the fact that they had a huge victory in the House, does she deserve some of the credit for that huge? sway back that blue wave of sorts back in the democratic direction look we all deserve uh, the she? credit she, she deserves part of it too um because she was willing to talk about to talk about health care now there are other remember that a bunch of these candidates who won uh won on a promise to vote for a new mm -hmm. leadership and one of the things that uh myself and my colleagues were willing to do is stand up for these freshmen uh so that they don't have to break a campaign promise with the very vote, first vote that they take in the house of representatives so there is you know there is a desire out there for new leadership but there there are also people who really uh, respect the status quo. One of the things I think it's important to say in this is that Nancy Pelosi has done extraordinary things for our party. Uh, she was the first woman to become Speaker of the House. I mean, talk about shattering a glass ceiling in politics. That is truly historic. I've never done anything historic like that. Uh, but it doesn't take anything away uh, from these leaders and their past accomplishments. I mean, Steny Hoyer and Jim Clyburn, all part of the top three, they've done extraordinary things Why as would you well. say they're too it old, by the way? Why do you avoid? You're worried about being called ages? 78, 79, and 78. You know what? Is I'll that let, not I'll too let old? You, I'll let no, you I'm asking you, though. Is that not too it's old not, to be the three leaders of the Democratic thing. Party in the House? It's not about age. It, it's about ideas and perspective. You know, one of the you, you, you shared a, uh, a nice clip from my for, from my from that town hall I had up in Amesbury. Yeah. Literally the most contentious clip. It's, it, you, you do a good job of finding. Thank this. you very much. Um, my producers are very skilled. They're Thank very you. very skilled. I, I think the most powerful uh, part of that discussion that we had up in Amesbury, um, where by the way, I mean the a, a huge number of people were there, uh, being very supportive, was a 17 year old uh, woman who came in and, and, and she said, I wake up every single day afraid to go to school because I think I'm going to get shot. And she said, Seth, why I'm here to support you and your call for a new generation of leaders is because I just don't think all the people in Congress get this. I don't think the leaders of our party get what it means to be from this generation where we face gun violence every day. Of course, I've been a big advocate for, for gun reform. And that's an important voice to hear as well. So. You know, older people deserve representatives in Congress, but younger people deserve representatives. Speaking too. of uh, uh, leaders uh, not hearing, as that young woman said, do leaders hear that the vast majority, at least in the polls I've seen, of Democrats want this president impeached? 
Because it seems to me the Democratic leadership and rank and file members have been dancing around the issue since they won the uh, November election. Where are you on this? I mean, a year ago, you voted against the tabling of an impeachment resolution. Uh, right. So this is a complicated, right, complicated vote. Now? But what that means is that I said we should have this debate. I was one of the few Democrats, only 58 Democrats, who said we should have a debate on impeachment. And I, and I, I put this explanation, you know, I, I wrote up an explanation online so people could understand this. I said this is not the right time to do this politically. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, it may not actually advance the argument, but fundamentally it's the right vote to take because we should have a discussion about this within the party. So my is point is that... Is it the right vote to take right now? I, absolutely. I would take that, I would take that vote again. again. But but importantly, Jim, what I'm saying is that we need to have a discussion about this. We need to have a debate about it. We need to investigate the president because it's the right thing to do under the Constitution. Under the Constitution of the United States, we have an obligation to pursue this investigation. Obligation? Now, absolutely, we have an obligation. Do you it's, think, it's, based on what you've heard so far, I know there's no Mueller report, we have indictments, convictions out of the Southern District of New York, U.S. Attorney's Office, yeah. Trump's own Justice Department, the Mueller investigation. Do you believe that, based on what has transpired so far, this president has committed impeachable offenses? Well, I think that the smart thing to do is to wait for the Mueller report to conclude. But I mean, do you that's think my, he's committed that's my position. impeachable offenses based on your... Based on what I have heard, I, I, I think that there's an awful lot there that is in the realm of impeachable so offenses. Is that yes? And that's why we should have this debate before the Congress. That's why I think my vote was the right one to take, even though, I mean, look, that was another place where I challenged Democratic leadership, because Democratic leadership was against us in the 58, saying that we should have this debate about impeachment. I think that we need to have that debate today. I think that we need to have it going forward. Now, there's a difference between having the, f having the debate on impeachment and actually saying now is the right time to vote for impeachment. I think it'd be smart to wait for that until the Mueller report comes out. You know, uh, in the way of the horrible, horrible death of this seven-year-old Guatemala kid, I hope I pronounced it, Jacqueline Kaal Makin, you've called for the resignation of uh, the woman who runs uh, Homeland Security for this president. Do you blame her and Homeland Security for the death of this young girl? I do, because that's basic, that's leadership. That's accountability. Explain that's to me taking... why they're, re they're responsible, or she or they are responsible for her death. You know, remember back when we were talking about Abu Ghraib? I was on my way into Iraq, I think it was for my second deployment, and I was in Kuwait, and I sat down for uh, this min di dinner, dinner at 3 in the morning, because that's a nice thing to do in the Marines, and, um, and I sat across from a guy in the Army, I'd never met him before, I asked him what he does, he said, I'm an interrogator. And this was a few months before Abu Ghraib, and I said, um, interesting, I, I don't know, any t tell me about your job, and what is, what is your deployment going to be like? And he said, oh, you heard Donald Rumsfeld, the gloves are coming off. And the point is that this very junior soldier, whose job was to be an interrogator, he had a lot of people between him and the Secretary of, uh, of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, but the leadership at the top matters. The tone set by the leadership at the top matters. And it's very clear that this president and his Secretary of Homeland Security have set a tone where it's okay to just let a girl like that die. Leadership stops at the, starts at the top. Accountability has to stop at the account at the top, and that's why this is the second time that I've called for her to resign. I mean, what's what's amazing is that uh, that I've been able to call on her to resign twice, and she's I, I picked a good target because she's one of the only cabinet officials who's still there and actually could resign because they haven't resigned on their own. I mean, almost all of I'm trying to make a joke, Jim. I, I mean, almost <laughs> almost all of Trump's cabinet has resigned on their own, um, I think it's time for her to go too. Except that's not a joke, that's true. Congratulations <laughs> to you and your wife on your kid, by the Thanks. way, Congressman. Really Thanks, Jim. Great thing. Seth Moulton.